Hello everyone, uh, myself C.A. Rohit Grover again and welcome to the another lecture on your paper number 3 Advanced Auditing and Professional Ethics. So as you can see that in front of your screen you might be knowing the fact that what topic we are going to cover today. So even though this topic is very small it is not going to be more than one hour discussion or more than 45 minutes or one hour discussion but yes from the examination point of view so many times the mcqs have been asked from this particular topic and sometimes you know the small small topics uh, small small uh, like questions have also been asked from this topic so they create basically a case law based question when they ask you the topic in this particular chapter right so what is the name of the chapter what we have to discuss now the, the name of the chapter is known as liabilities of an auditor so what is the name of the chapter everyone liabilities of an auditor so what kind of liabilities of an auditor we are going to understand in this particular chapter there are approximately seven to eight different types of liabilities of an auditor we are going to understand in this chapter first of all let me uh, show you the material which has been provided to you in accordance to material now what is there in our material you can see that in your module number three on the page number 217 you will find this chapter called liabilities of an auditor so name of the chapter is liabilities of an auditor so in this particular chapter when it comes to the material there are so many case laws have been provided to you for your reference purpose are you getting the point as i told you that the material is directly have been copy pasted from ICA or it has been drafted on the references which are made by the ICA so i always keep on suggesting in my classes also ki whenever we are talking about the auditing and assurance you have to make or whatever we are talking about the advanced auditing and professional ethics we always have to ensure that ki yes ICA material is the best source of material so i tried my level best to incorporate as many examples as many case laws which were they given in the ICA but for the examination purpose you just have to read out these case laws are you understanding the point you just have to read out these case laws these case laws will help you or will support you in understanding the provisions which we are going to observe in this particular topic clear everyone so make sure that ki these particular case laws which we are there in front of us they are not at all required to be learned from the examination point of view okay so as I was telling you that ki there are so many case laws which have been given in this chapter for your reference purpose to make sure that before leaving for the examination and when you are preparing for your own you must at least have a look of these case laws. Again repeating these case laws are not the part of your portion. They are not going to ask you the particular case law in the examination but yes on the basis of the case law on the facts of the case law sometimes they may draft a situation which will lead you towards the answer relating to the, this chapter called liabilities of an auditor say for example they may give you the example of one uh, prospectus or they may give you the example of any misleading information anywhere somewhere whatever the case may be so like you can see that so many legal cases have been discussed here you can see that the legal case number Candler versus Clay Christmas and company then we have Hadley Bryan and company limited versus Heller then we have Jeff Fastner's Marks Bloom and company so so many case laws you can see that so many case laws have been given but these are only for your reference purpose again I'm saying these are only for your which purpose reference purpose no need to learn them no need to mug up them just read it out understand them and then proceed further now sir what we are going to do in this chapter in this chapter this is a very small chapter actually i told you in the beginning also it will not take more than 45 minutes so one hour of discussion when it comes to this chapter so that's why i thought of making a small video dedicatedly only to this particular topic and it should be connected with your company audit actually so because there are so many penalties of the company audit which you are, which uh, companies act uh, 2013 which we are going to discuss in this particular topic so let me i will do one thing as and when will be proceeding in this chapter i will keep on taking you to this material also so that you can understand ki in the material what is the major content main content you have to read and what are the case laws you have to read so first we'll understand the major content of this particular uh, this uh, chapter and then you can refer the case laws on your own as you know that material is already there with you right so let us understand what this particular uh, this uh, topic called liabilities of an auditor is having there for you 
So in the basket of this particular topic called liabilities of an auditor, let me give you one thing, one very clarity. Now say for example, this is a person called auditor. This is a person called auditor. Now you all will agree with me that ki auditor is very much important element in today's corporate world. Do you understand or do you agree with my fact or not? Yes, sir. Let it be professional ethics. Let it be professional ethics or say for example, you can say that let it be CA Act 1949. Let it be Companies Act 2013. Let it be Income Tax Act 1961. So what I'm trying to tell you is whether you read the CA Act 1949 or you read the Companies Act 2013 or you read the Income Tax Act 1961. In all these acts, or you can say that other statutes also, other statutes also. Now, in all these acts, all these acts, you have seen that ki so many penalties have been introduced. Are you getting the one? And not, we don't have to go further away. We have seen recently in our company audit chapter, section number 132, NFRA has also started putting the penalties on the form of auditors. The question is, sir, we are professionals. We only provide the professional services. We only provide the assurance services, attestation services, auditing services, and uh, what do you say, uh, accounting services. Why we are getting punished? The answer is not why we are getting punished. The answer, the question should not be why we are getting punished. Question is, do we or do we have a responsibility on our shoulder to bring the ethical culture in the corporate world or not? Yes. Now, you all will agree with me in a very simple point. Ki, can I say that lakhs and crores of the people who are associated with the company, whom do we call stakeholders, are dependent upon a single signature of a chartered accountant or not? Am I correct or not? Now, let it be, you know, bank project report. Let it be auditor's report. Who are the users of our auditor report? So, lenders read our auditor's report. Shareholders read our auditor's report. Uh, bankers read our auditor's report. Creditors are interested in our auditor's report. Government takes our auditor report. ROC also interested in auditor's report. So when so many people are associated with our profession, when so many people are having expectation from our profession, so it is very much a responsibility of an auditor to show the ethical behavior in the market. Sometimes the auditors become negligence. Sometimes the auditor does something intentionally. I'm not saying all the chartered accountants are into this kind of unethical practices, but yes, there are so many, so many unethical, not like just, we can say that okay, there are small, small fish in this pond who are filthy and they make the whole pond filthy. There are small, small chartered accountants who are going to do the unethical practices. And on the basis of that, people will start judging the whole auditors community. Okay, yes, whole chartered accountant community, uh, community is very bad. So what happened in the various, various acts, in the various, various statutes, various, various types of liabilities have been introduced that we have clubbed it together at one place. That's why the name of your chapter is known as what? What is the name of your chapter? It is known as liabilities of an auditor. Clear everyone? So what is the name of the chapter, sir? Liabilities of an auditor. So here we are going to understand so many different, different types of liabilities. Are you getting the point? Some liabilities which you have already discussed will try to skip them because they are already discussed in your company audit. But I will try my level best to make you revise once again so that all the liabilities have been clubbed together at one place only. Right now, what are the types of liabilities? What are the types of liabilities we are going to discuss here? What are the types of liabilities we are going to discuss here? Now you can see that there are different, different types of liabilities we are going to discuss here. Or I'm going to tell you first, what are the places where the liabilities of the auditor have been discussed? So there are some liabilities under the Companies Act 2013, which we have, which are specifically on an auditor. If you remember section number 147, we have already understood in our company audit topic, section number 147, completely dedicated to the penalties on an auditor, right? Then under the income tax also, 1961, under the income tax also, also there are some provisions where the penalties of an auditor have been introduced. Then under the professional ethics, which in another way we call it as what? CA Act 1949. 
here also so many penalties have been introduced so what i'm trying to tell you that the companies act penalties relating to the auditor or liabilities of an auditor we have already discussed under companies act income tax penalties income tax liabilities on an auditor we are going to discuss here and professional eth ethics liabilities on an auditor or a chartered accountant in practice we are going to discuss when we'll do the we'll, we'll start the next series of uh, lectures in relation to professional ethics and one more thing now after this chapter i am directly going to complete your module number 2 which is known as professional ethics so on the professional ethics minimum 7 to 8 lectures are required minimum 7 to 8 lectures are required so i will try my level best to make the videos for a longer period of time so that we can wrap it up within 4 to 5 lectures but minimum i think minimum then also minimum 6 to 7 lectures definitely required am i correct or not so liabilities relating to the auditor under the chartered accountants act 1949 will discuss in the professional ethics regarding income tax act we'll discuss now and regarding companies act 2013 also we'll discuss now and i will immediately take you to your module material also ki where you will find this relevant areas which you have to learn for the examination purpose and i already told you in your module which has been provided to you so many case laws have been included as per the ica recommendations so that you can understand ki what makes the auditor liable what are the facts on the basis of which they may draw the question in the examination so at that point of time when you see the question in the examination you should be in a position to say that yes i know this answer and immediately start writing the answer so very brief chapter it is very small chapter it is the name of the chapter is known as liabilities of an auditor right now under the company act there are three or you can rather say four types of liabilities we have to discuss so what are the four types of liabilities we have to discuss we have to discuss the liability under section number 147 that we have already discussed in our company audit then we have the liabilities on the auditor under section 132 also which is called nfra then we have to discuss the liability under section 34 which is known as criminal liability and then we have to discuss the liability under section 35 which is known as civil liability sir criminal liability civil liability we have not even heard of these kind of liability you have heard my child you have heard you have heard it in your intermediate level in your ipcc level when you did the company law chapter called prospectus misstatement of prospectus section number 34 35 you have discussed over there at that point of time in the intermediate level and ipcc level we don't concentrate that much on sections so that's why you thought that ki this sections we have not done so we have already covered all the sections of the companies act already covered all the sections of the companies act it is just that i have to make you revise again in this particular video right then we have to discuss some penalties of the income tax act also some penalties of the income tax also under section 278 we have to discuss under section 288 we have to discuss under rule number 12a we have to discuss and under section number 271 i think 271j we have to discuss are you getting the point so these are the penalties of the income tax act 1961 we have to discuss and these are the penalties of companies act 2013 we have to discuss and as i already told you penalties on auditor or liabilities of an auditor under the professional ethics that is c act 1949 we'll discuss in our next series of lectures i hope all of you understood the structure so let us first start with the companies act and then i'll start with the income tax act and then we'll wrap up the whole this chapter called liabilities of an auditor right so let me first to take you to the material which you have to refer and what we have to understand in the material as you can see that in the material i mean the module which has been provided to you now there are so many legal case laws have been discussed you can see that one case law is discussed here one case law is discussed here one case laws is discussed here this is also the another case law this is another case law and then so many case laws have been given to you as per give as per required by the ic material so i copy pasted from the ic and inserted it here so that you can understand at one place only what are the case laws which they again i'm saying you these case laws are not required to be learned or not required to be mugged up just required to be seen once so that you will get an idea ki what this chapter is all about and why it is the chapter name is known as liabilities of an auditor i hope everyone is crystal clear what what the topic i am saying so actually from where you have to start actually from where you have to start you have to start from 
you can say that you have to start from here civil liabilities we have to start from the civil liabilities sir on which page yeah section number 35 civil liability now you can see that ki you have to start learning this chapter you have to start reading this chapter from the page number 225 so what is the page number page number 225 so from the page number 225 you have to make sure that ki you are reading this particular chapter called liabilities of an auditor so you can see that section number 135 penalties have been discussed here this whole particular topic is relating to section number one uh, sorry only 35 not 135 section number 135 then section number 34 is also there section number 32 which talks 34 talks about what it talks about the criminal liability so that is also you are going to find out at the later stage so you can see that uh, when the auditor is criminally liable see this is section number 32 34 which i was talking about what criminal liability am i correct then after that our income tax liabilities will come at one place only so i told you there are four income tax liabilities also we have to discuss what are the income tax liabilities liability under section 288 278 rule number 12a and 271j so why i opened this module for you so that you can have an understanding in the module where you have to learn this particular chapter and all the above all the above so you can say that from page number 225 so again i am repeating from the page number 225 you have to read out the material till last are you getting the point some case laws are going to come in between these pages also so those case laws you just read it out and i can assure you that ki once you will read those case laws you will get a better understanding of the section number 34 section number 35 and the four penalties relating to company set oh four penalties relating to income tax act 1961 right so page number 225 till last is the main chapter what you have to read sir before 225 from 217 to 225 there are some relevant case laws the relevant supporting elements have been given that you have to refer it for your own are you getting the point if you want to have a better grip over the chapter i will suggest that read those chapters and then move on read those case laws and then move on for the examination right so let us understand what are the topics we have to clear so these are the topics we have to understand here liabilities of an auditor under companies act and under the income tax act so where we are going to learn these liabilities these liabilities will learn in professional ethics that is what our next series of lectures so let us concentrate first liabilities of an auditor what is the topic name liabilities of an auditor under companies act 2013 so this is what our topic number one liabilities of an auditor under companies act 2013 so let us first go to the liabilities which we have already discussed under the previous sections which we have already covered in our company audit the first section which we covered was section number 147 if i'm not wrong i made you understand the specifically two types of liabilities over there so what was the one liability and what was the another liability now listen to this very carefully in case you are violating section number 139 143 144 and 145 in case the auditor is violating section number 139 143 144 and 145 then if you remember the penalty which we have already discussed why i am going fast here because we have already have a dedicated section video on section number 145 what is your penalty it is minimum 25000 maximum that is minimum 25000 then maximum 5 lakhs is the fine and it is going to be compared with four times of your remuneration four times of your remuneration whichever is lower this is a penalty which we have already discussed over there are you getting the point or not so that is what minimum 5000 so if you if you want i can show you there also okay i have already given the notes to you and relating to section number 147 which we had discussed separately 
so you can see that penalty for contravention section number 147 we have already discussed on the auditor if the auditor violates the section number 139 143 144 and 145 what is the penalty everyone minimum 25000 that's just now we have done maximum 5 lakhs or four times of the remuneration received whichever is lower and what is the second penalty we have done penalty on an auditor liability of an auditor in case the auditor knowingly cheats or deceits whom the company the creditors the income tax department or the shareholders in that case what is the penalty in that case the penalty is minimum 50,000 maximum 25 lakhs or eight times the remuneration received whichever is lower are you getting the point or not so let us write it again and let us revise it again so I already wrote if the auditor violates what if the auditor violates section number 139 143 144 145 minimum 20,000 25,000 maximum 5 lakhs or 4 times the remuneration received whichever is lower and in case the auditor intentionally deceits so what do you mean by deceits cheats sir whom members creditors income tax department or members creditors income tax department uh, members and company in that case what will be happening then the penalty will be minimum 50,000 maximum 25 lakhs or eight times the remuneration received whichever is lower so this is what the penalty under section 147 which you have already discussed and we have we have already covered under the company's audit then let's come to the next section so what was the next section section number 132 penalty if you remember 132 talks about which person sir nfra what is nfra national financial reporting authority if you remember under the national financial reporting authority we have discussed especially the two powers of nfra ki nfra is having a power to investigate whether auditor is guilty of professional misconduct or guilty of other misconduct or not and in case if it is proved then the nfra is having a power to impose penalty on auditor if you remember these are the two specific powers which we have already discussed under section number 132 and i still remember on section number 132 and section number 133 i made a separate video on that because i already told you ki nfra is a very 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 important topic so there we have already discussed ki this is a power number one and this is a power number two now let me just take you to that particular section and let me just show you or make you understand ki what was the penalty if you remember if the auditor is an individual firm if you were an individual auditor sir what do you mean by individual auditor if you are a sole proprietor auditor and you were found guilty of doing the professional misconduct indulge yourself in the fraud if you remember i made you see one news also at that point of time the news was relating to what the news was relating to ilfs limited company where the nfra banned the deloitte for seven years and imposed a fine of what imposed a fine of what 25 lakhs are you getting the point nfra has banned them for seven years and imposed a fine of what 25 lakhs so here also if you are an individual auditor and you have been found guilty of any kind of professional misconduct or other misconduct section number 132 says that ki nfra can impose a penalty on you sir how much penalty the nfra can impose nfra will penalize you with the minimum one lakh of fine maximum five times of remuneration received minimum one lakh of fine maximum five times of remuneration received and a minimum six months ban maximum 10 years ban minimum six months ban and maximum 10 years ban that is for individual auditor ban is equally applicable for the individual auditor as well as the form of auditor so in case form of auditors are found guilty of professional misconduct what do you mean by form of auditor 
either you are a partnership or you are a LLP, then in that case, minimum fine is 5 lakh. It means 5 times the individual auditor and maximum it is going to be 10 times the remuneration received. And I already told you the band related information is same. That is minimum 6 months, maximum 10 years of ban. Are you getting the point or not? So Deloitte as per NFRA was banned for 7 years and slapped with a fine of 25 lakhs. I, I hope you all remember that section we have already done. So under the Companies Act, I have already made you covered section number 147 penalty and I already made you covered section number 132 penalty on liability on auditor. Clear everyone? Yes sir. Now sir what is the next penalties we have to do? We have to understand two more penalties that is section number 34 and section number 35. So what is section number 34 and what is section number 35 penalty? Now listen. So what is section number 34 penalty? Now listen to this thing. Section number 34 penalty says that, first of all, let me tell you one thing. It is known as criminal liability. Criminal liability. So what is section number 34? It talks about criminal liability. Now listen to this very, 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 very carefully. Sir, what do you mean by criminal liability? Criminal liability means what? In case a company issues what? Offer document. In case the company has issued any offer document or a prospectus. In case a company has issued any offer document or a prospectus and such a document or prospectus such document or prospectus contains any untrue statement any material misstatement any fraud information or any misleading information are you getting the point so see if the company issues any kind of offer document to the public or if the company issues the prospectus to the public and in that particular prospectus or offer document any of the untrue statement is there or material misstatement is there or fraudulent information is there or misleading information is there then those persons, those persons who authorized, those persons who authorized to issue or issued, who authorized the prospectus to be issued or who himself has issued such a document or prospectus all will be punished under section 447 all will be punished under section 447 and i need not tell you what is section number 447 section number 447 is known as fraud penalty sections so if anyone is involved in any kind of fraud relating to company matters then in that case wherever the word called fraud will come 447 is always standing in front of you to welcome you in that particular fraud. Are you getting the point? So what is 447? So 447 we have already discussed. Uh, I think we have discussed it while doing the section number 140 relating to no, 140 subsection 5 removal of an auditor by a tribunal. There only I discussed the section number 447. So you can all refer that section. By the way, for your reference, I can still tell you what is the section 447. If the fraud amount involved, if the fraud amount involved is less than what 1% of turnover of the company or rupees 10 lakhs whichever is lower the fraud amount involved is less than either of these two whichever is lower then what is the penalty 
द पेनाल्टी विल बी फाइन अप टू रुपीज फिफ्टी लैक्स फाइन इज अप टू रुपीज फिफ्टी लैक्स एंड और सॉरी इंप्रिजनमेंट अप टू फाइव इयर्स और बोथ इफ यू रिमेंबर आई हैव ऑलरेडी डिस्कस बट एज वी आर डूइंग द लाइबिलिटी चैप्टर अगेन so i thought that i should discuss it with you again and in case the fraud amount involved is greater than or equals to greater than or equals to sir what same provision 1% of turnover of the company or rupees 10 lakhs whichever is lower then what is the penalty then penalty is fine sir how much fine minimum fraud amount is your fine how much fine you have to pay minimum the fraud amount fine you have to pay maximum it may go up to 3 times the fraud amount it may go up to 3 times the fraud amount and you will be sent to the jail or you can say that which we call it as imprisonment of minimum 6 months or minimum 3 years and maximum 10 years are you getting the point sir when minimum 6 months and when minimum 3 years 6 months if the public interest is not involved and minimum 3 years when the public interest is involved maximum you can be sent to the jail for 10 years but remember one thing it is not or here it is what and here but opposite to that we have an or so this is what the penalty on an auditor if he found guilty where under section number 34 what is 34 criminal liability so what is criminal liability if the company has issued any kind of public offer document or any kind of prospectus and that prospectus included any misleading information it included any fraudulent information it included any material misstated information or it included any untrue inter information which the subscribers of the shares have believed upon and they have suffered the loss then those persons those persons who are associated with that prospectus who allowed that prospectus to be issued or who issued this prospectus everyone will be penalized under section 447 that is called criminal penalty and including the definition of those persons sir what do you mean by those person those persons here include chartered accountant also so as a chartered accountant do we certify the prospectus or not yes part c gives the certification that all the information relating in part a and part b of the prospectus is true and correct and who certifies that part c of the prospectus chartered accountant so it means chartered accountant is also associated the auditor is also associated in giving that information in that prospectus it means that was a nothing but a case of gross negligence or you can say that it is intentional fraud done by the chartered accountant in that case even the auditor of the company if is associated with that misleading information will also be punished under section 447 and what is section 447 that has already been told to you in front of you so let us read it from the material and then we'll move to the section number 135 right now what is there section number 447 now where do we find yes from page number 245 now see this is called criminal liability section this is called criminal liability section yes now see this is what section number 34 so let us understand section number 34 of the companies act 2013 says that where a prospectus is issued or circulated or distributed includes any statement which is untrue misleading in the form or context in which it is included where any inclusion or omission of any matter is likely to mislead so i made it little bit simpler ki if any prospectus contains any false information misleading information untrue information or any kind of material misstatement then the every person who authorizes the issue of such prospectus shall be liable under section 447 this section shall not apply to a person if he proves that such statement or omission was immaterial or that he had a reasonable grounds to believe it now that i am yet to tell you ki what do you mean by that but that will do later on let us understand the next thing what is the punishment according to the section number 448 of the companies act if any return report certificate financial statement prospectus statement or other document required by any for purpose of any provisions of the act or the rules made there under any person makes that statement which is false in material particulars which omits any material factor knowingly to be material 
he shall be liable to be punished under section 447. So that is what I discussed with you. Okay, if the auditor is also associated with that false information, untrue information, misleading information, then in that case, that particular auditor is also going to be punished under section 447. Clear everyone? Yes, sir. We are clear. So... <clears throat> There are some cases which have been given. I already told you for your reference to so make sure that you are reading those cases to have a better understanding of this section. But I don't think so that okay, after doing the section by this video, you will be uh, having any kind of doubt relating to that. And there is no need to read those case laws. Such kind of feeling you will get. But still understand the importance of the case laws. Make sure that you are reading the case laws before leaving for an examinations. Right. So that is for your own good only. Clear. Now let me take you to the topic again. I already told you section number 447 and I already told you section number 34. This is the third section of the Companies Act where the liability of an auditor takes place. So what are the first sections we are done with? Section number 147 penalty I already told you. Section number 132 penalty also I already told you. Now section number 34 penalty I already told you. Now I have to tell you one thing. Escape from escape from criminal liability so when the auditor can escape from the which liability criminal liability point number one i already told you or if you have already understood in the prospectus chapter if the auditor i am writing the word here auditor but actually the concept is if a person if a auditor or a person makes believe to the court of law that his information his information his statement role or that particular data in that offer document or prospectus was immaterial what was that immaterial what do you mean by immaterial was not important at all so as an auditor if you are able to prove to the court of law okay, sir my statement on which i have certified and later on it turned out to be what untrue statement but my role my role in that my statement in that and my opinion on that was completely immaterial in nature. It was not at all a statement. It was not at all an information to be believed upon. It was completely not important. It was not at all significant at all. If you are able to prove that in the court of law, then the court of law uh, may grant you the relief under section one, uh, section 34 and it may not punish you under section 447. That is what the escape point number one. Or if a person can prove that till the end that is till the issue of prospectus the information published was believed to be true believed to be true clear everyone so if we can prove that ki my information was material or till the end of the prospectus, I believe that information is true. I don't know later on how it became untrue. Then in that case, he may escape from the section number 34 and he will not be penalized under section 447. That is what is rendered in section number 34, which is talking about which liability? It is talking about the criminal liability. Right or not? So let us understand what is section number 35 is talking about now. Then we'll write it in our notes. Now see, section number 35. See, remember, 132 NFRA, 147 specific penalties on an auditor under company audit. And 34 talks about criminal liability and 35 talks about what? Civil liability. So let us understand the penalties of an auditor under the civil liability section number 35. Right? Now, let us understand what is section number 35 tells you. Section number 35, you can all see. Damages for negligence. First of all, this is again a section connected with the prospectus and offer document only. But there is a thin line of difference which you have to understand between 34 and 35. 34 completely dedicated to criminal liability. It means you will be sent to the jail under section 447. 
if you are found guilty under a criminal liability of section number 34 but section number 35 is not a criminal liability it is a which liability everyone civil liability so civil liability for misstatement in the prospectus that is criminal liability for misstatement in the prospectus so where a person has subscribed for a securities of a company suppose there is one person who bought the shares of a reliance in a limited acting on any statement included or the inclusion or omission of any matter in the prospectus which is misleading and has sustained any loss or damage as a consequence thereof the company and every person who is expert referred to in subsection 5 of subsection section 26 it may be noted that the term expert but i will tell you what is the remaining paragraph they are saying first of all understand what is section number 35 saying section number 35 saying that suppose there is one company which has issued a prospectus or an offer document that prospectus and offer document contained any misleading information someone believed that misleading information and after believing that misleading information he bought the shares on the basis of that information am i correct or not and say for example i am that person and reliance prospectus came now in the reliance prospectus there was one information written Ki yes, company does not have any kind of pending suits against it since last five years. This was the information written. So I thought that, okay, the information written is correct only. I thought that Reliance is a very good company. I bought the shares of the Reliance India Limited based on that information. But later on, after a few days, it was proved in the court of law or it was coming in the newspaper or it was coming in the advertisement on the television that the information on the prospectus of the Reliance was containing a misleading information about the contingent liabilities. Did I believe that information or not? Yes, I believed. And on the basis of that information, did I buy the 10,000 shares of Reliance or not? Yes. And I lost my money. I lost my complete investment because after that information, the share price of the Reliance went down and my total 10 lakh rupees which I invested in the Reliance completely went into zero. Did I lose the money? Yes. Did I suffer a loss? Yes. Did I suffer a damage? Yes. Because of what? Because of that misleading information. Now the question arises, sir, that misleading information has been given by whom? If any expert has also been involved in that misleading information, then that expert also will be liable to pay the damages to the person who has suffered a losses. Now the question is sir, what do you mean by expert? Now subsection number 5 of section number 26 defines what expert. Now under the companies act also under section 2 subsection 38 expert definition has been given. So there are two things about the expert what you have to learn under section 26 subsection 5 and under section 2 subsection 38 of the companies act 2013. Now we will see whether chartered accountant comes in the definition of expert or not. If we are coming in the definition of that expert then yes we will be penalized under section 34 or 35 also for the civil liability. It means I might be coming in the definition of an expert and I am the one who certified that misleading information due to which one of the subscriber to the security suffered a loss or damage. What is my responsibility? I'll be civilly liable to pay him the damage of compensation. How much damage of compensation? That is not at all written in the company's act. It means it is very simply written without any limit. There is no limit on that. Whatever the court will think that that is justifiable compensation, chartered accountant, the auditor of the company has to pay that liability. That depends upon case to case basis. But let us understand ki whether section number 2, subsection 38 of the company's act talks about the expert, whether we chartered accountants are included in that definition or not. So see, it may be noted that the term expert has been defined in section 2, subsection 38 of the company's act includes engineer valuer and whom chartered accountant it means yes we are covered under the definition of what expert company secretary is also covered cost accountant is also covered and any other person who has power or authority to issue a certificate in pursuant to any law for timing in force so here as per section number 34 what is written who is an expert and expert includes what chartered accountant so yes we are civilly liable under section 35. Are you getting the point? So there we will criminally liable under section 34. So remember, what is the major difference between 35 and 34? 34 was, it was containing misleading information and you authorized to issue. 
this prospectus. 35 saying that it was containing a misleading information. Someone believed on that information, bought the shares and later on he suffered a loss or damage because of you. So there you authorized. If you were one of the people who authorized to issue the prospectus, then you will be liable to be penalized under section 34. But if you are on your basis of your misleading information, if someone believed that information, bought the shares of the company, suffered a loss and lost the complete investment, suffered a damages, losses, cost, then in that case you will be civilly liable. There you are criminally liable and here you are civilly liable. There you are punished under section 447 and here you will be punished to pay the damage or compensation without any limit. So yes, chartered accountants are included in the definition of expert. Section number 2, subsection 38 already told that. Are you getting the point? The liability would arise if the written consent of the auditor to the issue of prospectors, including the report purporting to have made by him as an expert has been obtained. Are you getting the point or not? This is what the penalty under section 35. Are you getting the point? Now see, the term misfeasance implies a breach of trust. The auditor of the company would be guilty of misfeasance if he has been guilty of any breach of trust or negligence in the performance of his duty which has resulted in some loss or damage to the company or its property. A few cases in which action has been brought against the auditor under misfeasance provision of the company sect are summarized as below. So make sure that you are reading all these case laws for your support. So my purpose is to tell you what is section number 1, section number 34. So let us understand section number 35 now. So what is section number 35? Section number 35 talks about what? Civil liability now. It talks about civil liability. Now, what is section saying that? If any person has subscribed or purchased securities of a company believing upon a statement or information or omission of information. Suppose something was required to be given but you have not given that information. That is also material misstatement. See, what do you mean by material misstatement? Material misstatement means three. Giving wrong information, giving no information, giving half information. Half information is also dangerous. Giving no information, you have not at all giving an information. That is also dangerous. That is called omission of information. And giving a wrong information is dangerous. So half disclosure, wrong disclosure, no disclosure of the information will be treated as material misstatement. Clear everyone? So either you have given the information which is half or you have given the information which is wrong or you were supposed to give an information but you have not given the information all three will be covered under what misleading information. So see the section what it is saying if any person has subscribed or purchased the securities of a company believing upon a statement or information or omission of the information due to which such person suffered losses, injury or damages and, and if expert was involved in issuing such information then in that case, if found guilty, will be penalized under section 35, will be penalized under section 35. Now the question is sir, who is an expert? Sir, expert is covered under section number 2, section, subsection 38 of Companies Act. 2030. In that, we have to write whether we are covered or not. So, expert includes an engineer, a valuer, a chartered accountant,
a company secretary and a cost accountant clear so what we are bothered about are we bothered about a cas or cma or we are bothered about a chartered accountant chartered accountant so are we covered in this definition or not yes we are covered therefore yes here auditor is covered therefore he or she is liable under section 35 now what is a liability or what is a punishment liable to pay penalty in terms of damages or compensation without any specified limit sir there is no limit specified in the act sir what do you mean by that sir any amount it's not just like that any unlimited amount it is just that that depends upon case to case basis that depends upon case to case basis how important was your information if it is highly important the damage and the compensation also will be higher you have to pay if it is least important the damage or the compensation will be least you have to pay now the question arises sir is there any also escape point like what we have done under uh, section number 34 here also can we escape from section number 35 penalty answer is yes here you can also escape like section number 34 in the section number 35 also there are some escape points so what do you mean by escape points so let us understand what are the escape from which liability civil liability so there we have written escape from which liability criminal liability so what were the two points in escapism from criminal liability if you can prove to the court of law that my information is immaterial and up to the end or till the issue of the prospectus i believed it to be true there are three informations which you have to prove to the court of law either of these three things you prove in the court of law you can escape from the which liability sir i can escape from the civil liability also as an auditor now what you have to prove the information statement or opinion was published without without the expert's knowledge it was issued without the expert's knowledge or without expert's permission say for example i am a chartered accountant and i have given one information and i have given one statement but they published it without my permission if i can prove that in the court of law sir they have done wrongful or unethical thing they have published it without my permission then in that case i may escape from the which liability civil liability second thing and one more thing yes 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 it was published without your permission and you have taken action to withdraw it before prospectus was published very important point and you have already withdrawn your information before the prospectus was published prospectus was about to get published you withdrawn your information and you proved that in the court of law then the court will not find you guilty under section number 35 and you can escape from the which liability civil liability so section number what under section 35 now here what is the second case the prospectus is already issued prospectus is already issued so now prospectus is already issued how i can escape but when you come across that information published was misleading information whatever the information you have given published was misleading after issue the prospectus then you have take you have taken necessary or corrective action was taken You have taken a necessary or corrective action that is you have given 
public notice for the same sir what do you mean by public notice you went to one newspaper agency you want to one public newspaper and you have written and given a public notice saying that ki this information on that page of this company's prospectus is misleading have been issued by me please do not believe that information did you take the corrective action or not because the things have been out of control now prospectus to already issued but at that point of time you have to make sure that your information published was misleading you are declaring that in the public notice and you are telling in the public notice that ki please do not believe on that information did you prove your ethics or not yes i prove my ethics whatever i was supposed to tell to the public i told them by giving a which notice public notice then if the court is satisfied with the reaction you can escape from the penalty under section 35 now what is the third point if auditor believed that information as it was issued by an another expert say for example i gave one statement i am an auditor of reliance in limited i signed one statement but that statement was not purely mine i believed some experts statement on the basis of that experts statement i also signed because i don't know whether that expert is a fraudulent purpose or not what kind of intention that expert is having are you understanding my point so there was one expert called x he gave me one information which i needed for my purpose he gave me one information he is an expert i believe that ki that expert is a very faithful person i also signed that statement on the basis of that expert's statement now later on i came to know that that expert was a fraudulent person so just because that expert was a fraudulent person the other person was fraudulent person i was unaware about that i should not be punished so if the auditor believed that information as if the auditor believed that information as it was issued by another expert and he believed him and he believed that expert and later on the expert found out to be found out to be fraud or untrue person right or not if you are able to prove to the court of law if you are able to prove to the court of law ki i believed one expert that expert has given me my information on the basis of that information i also signed the statement but later on that expert found out to be a untrue person then what shall i do then in that case again you may escape from the which liability civil liability so with that we can say that our penalties under section 132 100 47 100 oh, sorry 34 and 35 year over it means you can say that ki we are able to complete our company law penalties are you getting the point we are able to complete our company law penalties so let us wind up this chapter by doing the penalties under the which act income tax act under the which act income tax act so let us write the name of the heading penalties or you can say that liabilities of an auditor under income tax act 1961 income tax act 1961 so let me give you the idea of the penalties first so there are total four different types of liabilities of an auditor we have to understand so section number 288 we'll understand first then section number 278 also we'll understand then rule number 12a we'll understand and then very newly inserted under the companies amendment act 2017 this section was introduced section number 271j also we'll understand now each section says a different different things now let me give you one broader idea first of all section number 288 says that ki if you are a chartered accountant or you are a legal practitioner and you were debarred you were debarred by the income tax authority 
to represent any kind of assessee in the income tax authority, then for how long you are debarred, you are not allowed to represent any assessee's case in front of income tax authority. That is what section number 288 is saying, but we'll go in detail. What is 288? Then section number 278 saying that ki you motivated as an auditor, you motivated or as a chartered accountant, you motivated any assessee, you induced any assessee to evade the taxes. And if the assessee was successful in evading the taxes, which is more than 25 lakhs amount of taxes or less than equals to 25 lakhs amount of taxes, then what is the penalty on that chartered accountant? Assessee penalty is different. Escaping assessment penalty he will be imposing. But on the chartered accountant who motivated that excessy to evade the taxes, that penalty also we have to discuss. Rule number 12 says that ki if you were supposed to give any information to the income tax authority, you gave that certificate, you gave that information, you gave that statement, but you already knew that the information as a chartered accountant, what you are giving to the income tax authority is untrue and you also believed it to be false. Then in that case, again, there will be a penalty and section number 271J says that it is a newly inserted session if you are a merchant banker, if you are a registered valuer or if you are a chartered accountant and you were supposed to give any statement or report issued to whom assessing officer or income tax department that report contains the incorrect information that certificate contains the incorrect information and you already know that ki, that information was incorrect while issuing it then you will be charged with the penalty of rupees 10,000 per report issued or per certificate issued these are the four penalties of an auditor we have to discuss under section 278 288 rule number 12a and 271 shall we proceed so before that as we already do that we have to first understand what i say our own material is saying now see what our material is saying let us understand so you can see that penalties under the income tax act has started from the page number 234 so you just go directly to the page number 234 and let us read these penalties which are given under the income tax act so i already told you penalty under the income tax act are given under 238 288 278 rule number 12a or 271j so first let us understand what is 288 is saying so once we'll understand here then we'll note it down on our notes as we do always now see a person so who that person a person who has been convicted of any offense connected with any income tax proceeding or any on whom a penalty has been imposed under the said act is disqualified from representing the assesses what they are saying that what they are saying that sorry so what they are saying that a person who has been convicted of any offense connected with any income tax proceeding you are a chartered accountant and you are already connected with some offense and you have been convicted under the income tax proceeding or income tax department has imposed any kind of penalty on you you as a chartered accountant or you as a legal practitioner you are disqualified from representing any SSE. Who disqualified you? The chief commissioner or the commissioner of income tax has given powers to determine the period of such disqualification person. Now, who is that person? Chartered accountant. If the chartered accountant was disqualified by any other act or under the income tax act or we were already having any imposition of penalty on us under the income tax authority then as a chartered accountant we are not allowed to represent any kind of assessee in any kind of proceeding in front of income tax authority now see subsection 4 of section 288 of the income tax says that no person no person who has been dismissed or removed from government service after 1st april 1938 if you were a government servant and you were removed or dismissed from the government service on or after 1st April 1938, then you are permanently disqualified to represent any assessee in the income tax authority. Again, I'm saying, your, what is your disqualification period? Permanent disqualification. Permanent means what? You will never be allowed if you were removed or dismissed from the government service after 1 4 1938 you are permanently disqualified sir where it is written nothing is written here you will find all those penalties here you can see that disqualification in point number a 
disqualification in point number b disqualification in point number c and disqualification in point number d so very what is this a b c d a b c d is nothing but clause a clause b clause c and clause d so where are these clauses given these clauses are given under section number 288 subsection 4 of income tax act 1961 so what is the clause number a saying that okay, if you were removed or dismissed Let's do it in a collaborating way. If you are removed or dismissed from the government service after 1st April 1938, then what is the period of your uh, disqualification to represent any SSC in the income tax authority? For all times in this case of a person referred to in clause A. It means permanent disqualification. Then what is the clause number B? Who has been convicted of any offense connected with any income tax proceeding or on whom penalty has been imposed under this act? other than the penalty imposed under section 271j of subsection 1 of 272a then in that case you will be what you will be for such time as the prescribed now how much disqualification will be imposed on you if you are disqualified under b clause if you are disqualified under b clause first of all let us understand what is b clause saying you were convicted for any kind of income tax proceeding or any kind of imposition of fine was imposed on you under this act sir who is on you chartered accountant so if the chartered accountant was convicted for any kind of income tax proceeding or if the chartered accountant was guilty of any kind of imposition of fine under this act then your disqualification period for not able to represent the accessory will be decided by the chief commissioner or by the commissioner of tax are you getting the point so see in the clause number b who will decide for such a time as the principal chief commissioner or chief commissioner or principal commissioner or commissioner of may by order determined in the case of person referred to in clause number b so if you are disqualified under clause number b then the chief commissioner or principal commissioner or principal chief commissioner will determine ki for how long you are disqualified and if you are disqualified under clause number c who has become an insolvent if the chartered accountant has become an insolvent till the time your insolvency is not over you are disqualified now see for the period during which the insolvency continues in this case of person referred to in clause c so you are disqualified for the insolvency period for which you are insolvent till that time you are disqualified and clause number d sir who has been convicted by a court for an offense involving fraud if the chartered accountant was disqualified by the court for an offense containing fraud then in that case minimum 10 years disqualification for a period of 10 years from a date of conviction in the case of person referred to in clause do you remember that section number 141 subsection 3 it is that only section number 143 sorry so section number 141 subsection 3 disqualifications of an auditor out of 11 disqualifications which i told you one of the disqualification was there where the auditor has been disqualified or where the auditor will be disqualified if he has been convicted for the fraud and minimum 10 years have not elapsed do you remember that one of the disqualification we have already covered in section number 141 subsection 3 disqualifications of an auditor same like that section 288 subsection 4 is also saying ki if you were disqualified by the court for an offense containing a fraud or convicted by the court for an offense containing fraud minimum 10 years that is what section number 288 is saying so let us write what is 288 is saying now what is 288 now see if an accountant if an so let us write if an accountant any chartered accountant let's talk about any chartered accountant or let me write the word called auditor if any chartered accountant or an auditor is disqualified under section 288 from representing any SSE in the income tax proceeding correct the four types of disqualification are there and along with that how long you are going to get disqualified that also I am going to write here only disqualification number one removed 
और डिसमिस्ड फ्रॉम गवर्नमेंट सर्विस आफ्टर फर्स्ट अप्रैल 1938 व्हाट इज द पीरियड ऑफ योर डिस्कालिफिकेशन दिस टॉपिक इज नोन एज पीरियड ऑफ डिस्कालिफिकेशन सो व्हाट डू यू मीन बाय पीरियड ऑफ डिस्कालिफिकेशन टिल दैट टाइम यू आर डिस्कालिफाइड फ्रॉम रिप्रेजेंटिंग एनी एसएससी इन द इनकम टैक्स डिपार्टमेंट यू आर नॉट अलाउड टू रिप्रेजेंट एनी काइंड ऑफ केस इन द इनकम टैक्स डिपार्टमेंट परमानेंट दिस डिस्कालिफिकेशन इज व्हाट इन नेचर परमानेंट इन नेचर सो व्हाट इज द सेकंड डिस्कालिफिकेशन if you were convicted for any income tax proceeding or imposed penalty under this act then in that case first of all your disqualification will be determined by who by either chief commissioner of income tax or principal chief commissioner of income tax or principal commissioner of income tax or commissioner of income tax so whatever the period they will decide till that time you are disqualified from representing the assessee in the income tax authority so what is the next point the point number 3 in case you were you know insolvent in case of insolvency then in that case till the time insolvency continues i hope now these notes are looking better to you to understand for the examination purpose yes and point number 4 if you were convicted for fraud offense underline the word fraud offense by the court then in that case then in that case what will happen in that case 10 years from such conviction you are disqualified i hope all of you understood section number 288 penalty on an auditor under income tax act 1961 so if you are convicted or if you are disqualified from representing assessee in the income tax authorities under section 288 then for how long you are disqualified that we have discussed in this particular topic so if you are disqualified from the government service then permanent disqualified for imposition of penalty and in that case till the time the commissioner is deciding the time period convicted for fraud by the court then minimum 10 years if insolvency is the reason of your disqualification then till the time you are insolvent you are disqualified now what is section number 278 now let us understand what is 278 is talking about now what is section number 278 guys in case where the amount of tax or penalty or interest of the income which would have been evaded if the declaration account or statement had been accepted as a true for which is willfully attempted to be evaded exceeds 2500000 with the regress appraisement for a term which should not be less than 6 months but which may extend to 5 years and fine year and in any other cases with the regress imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 3 months which may extend to 2 years or with a fine so let me tell you what section 278 is saying सो so, सर इतना फास्ट पढ़ लिया हमें मौका ही नहीं दिया आपने पढ़ने का तो मैं हूं ना मैं तुम्हें लिखवा रहा हूं ना तो लिसन टू दिस वेरी केयरफुली इफ अ चार्टेड अकाउंटेंट इंड्यूस्ड और मोटिवेटेड एन असेसी इफ एज अ चार्टेड अकाउंटेंट i induced or motivated an assessee to evade to evade income tax any penalty or any interest on income if i motivated or induced any assessee to evade evade means what to avoid 
any kind of income tax penalty or interest on income which is genuinely to be paid genuinely to be paid by assessee then what will happen i as a chartered accountant motivated an assessee to evade the tax array i will tell you the scheme you need not pay that much of tax you need not pay and that income tax department came to know that you have done it intentionally and it was a genuine tax what the assessee should have paid but on the basis of chartered accountants advice that assessee has evaded the taxes then in that case what is the penalty now see the penalty in that case see the penalty in that case see um we have a problem here problem here where should i write generally to be paid so let me write this here only so let me just draw the line of bifurcation for you people let us do one thing you can do one thing Let's keep it aside for some period of time. Then we'll be in a position to do it. Or I will be able to, you know, insert it at one place. Because it was coming in between. Now see. Where were we? Don't worry. That is still there. That is still there. So I will do one thing. I will. Now see, don't worry. Your section number 288 disqualifications are still below. Are you getting now? It is as it is given below it is just that it was coming in the way of my section number 278 that's why i have skipped it little bit below now see what was 278 guys let us revise if you are a chartered accountant and you are motivating an assessee to evade the tax or to evade the interest penalty to evade the any penalty then in that case that tax or that income was generally required to be paid by the assessee then what is a penalty what is a penalty now see it depends upon if the tax evasion now you can see that what was the amount of tax evasion if the tax evasion exceeds 2500 rupees now see what they are trying to tell you is if the, if the tax evasion was exceeding 25 lakhs if the assessee was successfully able to evade the taxes more than 25 lakhs on the suggestion of a chartered accountant then that chartered accountant will be punished with the minimum six months maximum five years of imprisonment and with the fine sir what is the fine that fine will be decided on the basis of priority a fine will be decided on the basis of priority right so what do you mean by priority that will define that will be defined on the basis of time to time basis am i correct and if the amount of evasion of tax if the amount of evasion of tax is less than or equals to evasion of rupees 25 lakhs if the amount is less than or equals to evasion of rupees 25 lakhs if it is exactly 25 lakhs of evasion of tax by the SSE or less than that then in that case minimum three months of imprisonment maximum two years of imprisonment i think and with the fine also here so let us read it from the material again what they are saying are we correct or not so see here what they are saying that if the declaration account or statement had been accepted as a true of which willfully attempted to evade it exceeds 2500,000 means what 25 lakhs with the regress improvement of a term which shall not be less than six months but which may extend to five years and with fine this is a penalty on that and in other cases in any other case 
with a regress imprisonment of a term which shall not be less than three months and which may extend to two years and with fine. So other cases means what? If more than 25 lakhs, this is a penalty. If less than equal to 25 lakhs, that is a penalty. That is what we have written also. So if the evasion of the tax is exceeding 25 lakhs, minimum six months of jail, maximum five years of jail and with the fine. And if it is less than equals to evasion of 25 lakhs, minimum three months, maximum two years and with the fine. This is what brings an end to our section number 278 penalty on a chartered accountant. Now see. So what is section number 12a? Section number 12a is a rule basic to uh, income tax rule. What is 12a is saying? Now see, if a report contains any information, now see, if the report contains any information which is false and which the chartered accountant either knows or believes to be false or untrue, he would be liable to a regress imprisonment which may extend up to seven years and with a fine. So sir, what the exactly the income tax act is saying that if if a chartered accountant, if the chartered accountant has issued any information, report or accounts to income tax authority, which were obviously false and chartered accountant knew it to be false then in that case means you did it intentionally then in that case such chartered accountant or such auditor will be penalized for a imprisonment up to how many years guys seven years and with the fine that again will be decided on the case to case basis so these are the various regress imprisonments under section number 288 of income tax act 278 of income tax act rule number 12a now what is section number 271j is saying now see section number 271j is saying that if a chartered accountant or registered valuer or a merchant banker issues any certificate or report to assessing officer to the which officer assessing officer or you can simply write income tax department or income tax authority knowing it to be false knowing to be false then sir what is the penalty rupees 10,000 per certificate issued correct everyone what is the penalty rupees 10,000 per certificate issued this is the penalty Matlab, the, as many certificates you have issued rupees 10,000 flat penalty for per certificate issued what is the penalty under rule 12a the penalty under rule 12a is imprisonment up to seven years and a fine which is going to be decided on case to base and here the major penalty is this if the evasion is more than 25 lakhs then minimum jail of six months maximum five years and with a fine and the evasion is 25 lakhs or less then minimum three months two years and with a fine and here here basically in section 288 there is no fine there is a disqualification so what is a disqualification there are total four types of disqualifications first disqualification is permanent in nature second disqualification which will be decided by Commissioner of income taxes third disqualification till your insolvency continues and fourth the disqualification is minimum 10 years and that we have already discussed in detail right everyone so don't worry section 288 you can see this big arrow is going towards here so your remaining part of section 288 is already here correct everyone so these are the income tax penalties you can see that it is given under one section only so with that we are completed our Companies X penalty. So, what are the sections of Companies Act we have covered? Let us see what are the sections we have covered. We covered section number 147, 132, 34, 35. And here we have covered 278. What is 278? It is talking about the fine and jail. What is 288? Disqualification. What is 12A? Fine and jail. And what is 271? 10,000 rupees per certificate wala penalty. Are you getting on? Right? This is talking about evasion. This is talking about disqualification 
from representing the SSE. This is talking about untrue information and this is talking about untrue or false certificate, right? So these are the various penalties and I already told you regarding professional ethics penalties we are going to discuss when the professional ethics will start. So I think I told you that this video is going to be for 45 minutes or one hour but as you all know that once we start this particular topic we go into the deeper discussion and that is how the video ended up in one and a half hour approximately. So thank you so much for lending your patient ears guys. So I will borrow your ears again in our next video and rather you can say the next video lecture series which is on the professional ethics and what I am thinking that okay, along with the professional ethics I will try my level best to give you one uh, standard on auditing video also right. So I will try my level best and accordingly it will be uploaded and you can watch as per your convenience. So thank you so much for lending your patient ears again and understanding one another chapter called liabilities of an auditor. I'll borrow your ears again in the next lecture. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Stay at home.